Anyway, um, welcome to a talk on Simon Bolivar, the liberator. Um, he is a, a, a fascinating character who I must say, having lived for so many years in Latin America, one hears his name and I had never read a whole uh, life history of Bolivar uh, until I, I rashly said I would give this little talk. Um, and um, what a life he led. Um, as you will find out. I'm afraid I'm going to rattle through because there's a lot to cover. Um, and I want to say right from the beginning, I'm not a historian. I was one of those people who had to choose between history and geography and, and chose geography. But reading about people like Bolivar and the other people I've been talking about has been absolutely fascinating and leads one down all sorts of wormholes, uh, uh, fascinating wormholes. Um, anyway, I thought it might be useful just to start off with a little bit of history, uh, which I had to brush up on, and is designed really to put Bolivar's life in, and what he did, in context. Um, so Bolivar was born in 1783 and died in 1830, um, aged only 47, um, but he packed a lot in. Now, the War of Independence in the US had just finished when he was born. Um, and that, of course, was significant because I, I, other colonies in uh, the Spanish Empire um, could see that, that independence was possible. Um, the French Revolution and its knock on, and um, particularly um, uh, that chap called Napoleon was also really significant, as you'll hear, to the Latin American history. Um, I popped in the Battle of Trafalgar there because that cemented the uh, English um, uh, dominance of, of, of sea, and that was important. Um, a couple, uh, Napoleon's invasion of Portugal, which I'll come to, was really significant. Um, and I just put in a few other little things that I thought were interesting. Um, so one shares the time scale. So British attacking Buenos Aires, very unsuccessful, it must be said. Um, British invading Washington. I think that's the last time uh, the US has had its capital um, captured. Um, the Peninsula War, which we'll come on to, and then um, the US independence, uh, I must say, I hadn't appreciated this, but at the end of independence, if you look at that map at the bottom of the screen, the blue area is what the US was. Um, the pink at the top is was still British. The yellow uh, still part of the Spanish Empire and the white fairly indeterminate, though um, that was Louisiana territory, uh, which was a, a, a bought by the US. So at the times we're talking about, the US didn't occupy anything like the area that it does now. Um, but of course it did fairly shortly afterwards. Um, um, yeah, and, and Brazil, well, that's a separate story. And the, the map top right, I've just put there because I haven't got any maps later on. Um, and I thought, for those of you who haven't been to Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, or Peru, or Bolivia, uh, there they are laid out. Um, Venezuela, Caracas, up here. Um, um, the, the whole Andean spur coming up here, and actually one spur of it, it's not shown terribly well on this map, uh, is this, goes up through Merida, um, and the other spur, two spurs really, uh, through Colombia, um, and then Quito, which was known as Quito then, Ecuador didn't exist, um, Peru, which was the capital of the Spanish Empire in South America, um, and today's Bolivia, which was then called Upper Peru, and Bolivar rode his horse, um, apart from uh, the odd boat trip up and down between Guayaquil and Lima, uh, everywhere in that area, several times. So, uh, to get going, um, 
he was born in Caracas. Uh, he was born in Caracas in 1783, 24th of July. Um, the younger son, that's his elder brother, Juan Vicente, in the picture bottom right. Um, and he had two elder sisters. Now, the Bolivars were a wealthy family. Um, they had originally come from Spain um, several hundred years earlier. Um, um, the first Bolivar was the appointed accountant general of Venezuela uh, by the Spanish crown. He built the port at La Guara, and he was obviously quite a go-ahead guy. He introduced agricultural projects. Um, they were of the sort of caste that were, they called themselves mantuanos, um, and as a result, their wives were allowed to wear a mantua, a, a, a sort of veil. There were only nine families in Caracas who considered themselves at that level. Um, and it was all about levels then. Um, the little chart, which you probably can't see the writing, um, but it is basically a breakdown of the sort of um, the social hierarchy of the day. Right at the top were those who were born in Spain. So Bolívar and his family weren't one of those. Then came what they called criollos, creoles, people of Spanish blood who were born in a colony. Then came people of mixed race, that's the third line down. The next three uh, uh, categories are all various uh, uh, subdivisions of, of Africans, so had been brought over as slaves. And the bottom three subdivisions are all various um, um, native Indians of, of Venezuela. And in the 1500s, there were only 5,000 5, Spanish. Uh, there were 10,000 uh, African then slaves um, and 350,000 native um, Indians. And today, over two thirds of Latin Americans are of mixed race. And that is, uh, uh, is, is a melting pot. Um, anyway, in Bolivar's case, slavery absolutely still existed. His family had plantations, they had, they had slaves, they even had a rum distillery and a copper mine. Um, a slave was ordered to, to get married and give birth at the same time as Bolivar, so she could be the wet nurse. And her name was Hippolyta, and because his, both of his parents died very young, um, he absolutely adored her and relied on her, and in later life called her the father that he had never, never really remembered. Um, and um, as if he wasn't wealthy enough, uh, the priest who baptized him when he died two years later, left him a fortune as well, uh, which included a house, um, three plantations, 95,000 cacao trees, uh, and all his slaves. Um, despite all this, uh, Bolivar ran wild, as far as I can tell, on the streets of Caracas, um, and, um, and, and uh, was fairly undereducated and unruly. His early influences, uh, there was a chap called Simon Rodriguez, who was his teacher, uh, himself had a colorful life. Um, but I guess today his, his best known teacher was Andres Bello, who ended up, who was a philosopher. He, was, he, was called, he is called the intellectual father of Latin America, um, ended up um, in Chile, uh, wonderful uh, poet. And he taught him geography and literature uh, and a priest taught him maths and science, but uh, to be honest, I don't think it sounds as if much sunk in at all. Um, so the young Bolivar in 1799 um, took a ship to Spain. He had an uncle in Madrid uh, who was trying to uh, arrange a title for his elder brother because that would have improved their position in society. Um, um, the ship went via Mexico and it had a cargo of, um, of seven million silver coins uh, bound for Cadiz. Um, now the British were a bit of a threat, so, so ships tended to take a, a, a wiggly route to avoid the British, um, but they made it in the end. He stopped in, um, I should just say, he's, they stopped in, in Mexico and he visited Mexico City and was very impressed by the, um, its elegance and its splendor. So, so he was a young, so a, a teenager. Um, arrived eventually in Spain, uh, which was at war with England at the time. Um, but Bolivar was very well connected um, through his family. 
Um, and uh, he lived with the Marquis of Ustaris, who he greatly admired, and I guess is another father figure in his life, and who finally educated him because he had an extensive library. Um, and uh, the other interesting facts about Bolivar in Madrid was he discovered a love for dance and fencing. Um, and um, he also had a, um, ah yes, now Ferdinand VII, who's in the picture on the left of the screen, was about the same age as Bolivar. Ferdinand was the heir to the throne at the time and um, Bolivar played a game of badminton against Ferdinand. And during the match, um, Oliver uh, accidentally uh, whacked Ferdinand on the head with his racket. Ferdinand nearly stopped playing with his mother. The Queen told him to keep going. And Bolivar later in life uh, came up with this uh, little quote, um, who would have thought, um, who would have told Fernando that that accident was a, a, a prediction that one day I would take the most precious jewel from his crown. Uh, life. Anyway, Bolivar um, met a girl, met uh, Maria Teresa Rodriguez de Toro, who was um, from a, also a Caracas family, but they met in Madrid, um, fell in love, got married. Um, she was 20, he was 18, and they returned uh, to Venezuela, um, looking forward to a life of children and happiness. And um, Within five months, sadly, she was dead. She died of yellow fever. Um, he was 19 at the time and he never remarried. And again, looking back, uh, he, said, he, 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 he said, love was replaced in his head with political ideas. Now, Bolivar went back to Spain after that time in Venezuela, brief time, um, and he, went to Paris, which was at that time a gathering place for Creoles. Uh, in fact, he went with Fernando del Toro, a cousin of his, of his wife. He very much admired what Napoleon had done in the French Revolution. He saw the prosperity that he brought. Um, he also kept a ballerina. He met Alexander von Humboldt, who I've talked about in uh, a previous talk, who was ju just back from his years in, in Latin America with uh, the Frenchman uh, Bonplan. Um, and, um, but like Beethoven, Bolivar was very disappointed when Napoleon crowned himself emperor. And he said, from that day on, I looked at him as a hypocritical tyrant, an insult to liberty and an obstacle to the progress of civilization. So you can see he was always begin already beginning to have views. Um, he set off on a sort of grand tour to Italy uh, with Del Toro and actually his old teacher, Rodriguez. Uh, they, walk, they walked, apparently, over the Alps. Um, they went to Milan. They loved Florence. He was disappointed by Venice. He was inspired by Rome. Uh, he met the Pope uh, and refused to kiss his shoe, but that's another story. Um, and, um, and at the same time, um, the picture bottom right on your screen is Francisco de Miranda, another, another Venezuelan who was older than Bolivar. He was 55, a re respected soldier from the um, campaign in France. Uh, he was an early libertarian who Bolivar would have uh, read, read about, uh, who'd met Thomas Paine, for example. Um, and in 1806, uh, so when Bolivar was in Paris, he um, invaded Venezuela at Coro, a town on the north coast, uh, to try and sort of free it from Spanish uh, rule and failed. In fact, one of the defending officers was, was Bolivar's brother when we sent him. And this was just the time that Britain was attacking Buenos Aires and also failing. So just to put it all in context a bit. Um, Bolivar left Europe, sailed to the US. Um, and was very impressed by the progress they were making. It was inspirational. And he was also impressed by the fact that the US uh, leaders loved Francisco de Miranda. So, um, back to Caracas uh, in 1807. 
Um, at this point, uh, Napoleon invaded Portugal. Now, uh, the Spanish, who were meant to be allied with Napoleon, with the French, um, were outraged because Napoleon had to march across Spain to get to Portugal, uh, which I don't think he'd ask permission for. Um, Napoleon attacked Portugal because it was our only remaining ally in Europe, and they wanted to um, get it, and he wanted to get at the British. Anyway, um, it, they, he invaded Portugal. Um, the Portuguese royal family fled to Brazil in 1807. Um, and um, for a while, uh, Portugal was ruled from Brazil, but that, that is a separate story. <laughs> uh, Spain was effectively occupied. Um, and the effect on the colonies, viewing things from the colonies, was really significant. Um, having said that, um, the colonies uh, in Venezuela's case actually took seven months to realize that Napoleon had, um, had invaded Portugal, simply because due to the British blockade of the seas, news took such a long time to travel. Anyway, Napoleon then claimed that uh, France had invaded Spain, so all colonies should be under his rule. Uh, the British disagreed. Uh, Spain was still fighting back and the British helped the Spanish and that was the beginning of the Peninsula War. Um, but the effect on the colonies, Spanish colonies in Latin America was to think, is this time for separation? Um, and in Venezuela, a local uh, uh, junta, we call it now, I guess, a sort of collection of uh, vaguely military people got together, formed a sort of administration, still professing at this stage loyalty to the Spanish crown, uh, even though Ferdinand was in prison in France. So it was a period of caution. Um, at the same time, in 1809, um, in Quito, there was a little revolution. And today it's known as El Primer Grito, the first shout uh, for freedom. Um, but as far as Venezuela went, um, it was 1810 until there was uh, really more of a proper coup in Caracas, when the captain general from Spain was, was sent abroad and self-rule began, although still nominally loyal to Ferdinand. Um, for Bolivar, the result was that that uh, first government, and it's known as the First Republic, um, sent envoys around the world to tell the major uh, 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 nations um, to build relations with them and try and get themselves recognized. And Bolivar was sent to London. Um, now, England was fighting uh, wars at the time in Russia, Spain, France, and the Caribbean. And um, Bolivar was quite impressed by, despite all that, um, we were thriving. He was very impressed. He met um, Lord Wellesley, who was the foreign minister at the time, uh, Wellington's brother. Um, and um, they couldn't meet officially in, in the foreign office or wherever it was, but they met in Wells, uh, Wellesley's house. Um, and um, Bolivar completely ignored the instructions from his government back in Caracas. Um, he was told not to mention anything about complete independence, and that's exactly what he mentioned. Um, now, Wellesley um, couldn't agree officially with the idea that Venezuela should become completely independent, uh, but he did sympathize because Britain had always wanted a foothold in Latin America, and of course, their Buenos Aires invasion had failed. Anyway, at this stage, Bolivar met uh, Miranda, who was living in, in Grafton Street in London, still a great center for, for Venezuela in, 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 in the UK. The consulate is there today. And um, pers persuaded Miranda to return to Venezuela uh, and become uh, a leader, which, which happened in 1810. Um, the, the junta back in Caracas had been bickering, um, but their first constitution was very one-sided. Uh, and so the royalists, so we're, we're divided now into what they, they call themselves patriots or republicans, and the royalists who still supported the crown. The royalists um, 
had no trouble persuading those of mixed race to support Spain. Um, uh, and there were various cities around Venezuela, including Coral, Valencia, Maracaibo, uh, which were centers of royalist support. Um, and there were skirmishes, and this is really when Bolivar uh, gained his first military experience. Um, and the first nation, nation was actually called Colombia. Um, now, the illustration at the bottom there is, uh, was a painting done shortly after there was a, an enormous earthquake in Caracas on March the 26th, 1812. Um, and it was seen by many as, as God's hand against independence. At least 30,000 people died. Um, and that was really a slight nail in the coffin for that first republic. Um, Miranda, it turned out, wasn't a very effective military leader. He was good in defense, but not good in attack. Bolivar was sent to defend the port of um, uh, Puerto Cabello, which is on the Caribbean coast of Venezuela, and it had a really um, good fort. Um, uh, and he failed. The, the army in the fort turned to the royalists, and Bolivar had to flee by boat back to Caracas. Um, uh, and there was general sort of treachery and confusion. And um, one of the royalists, Domingo Monteverde, took over Caracas. So that M Miranda was captured, he was exiled, um, he died some years later. Uh, Bolivar never really uh, forgave him. He felt he'd been far too defensive, um, but he managed to, Bolivar managed to get a passport to leave the country. Um, and that was effectively the end of the first republic. Now, Bolivar had, had left the Republic, uh, sorry, left Venezuela as it was again, um, and um, sailed to Cartagena uh, on the coast of today's Colombia. Um, at that time, it was known as Nueva Granada, and the various important cities were really, uh, had their own little governments, uh, and they were on the verge of civil war. So when uh, Bogota just declared itself the capital. So Bolivar, who had some military experience, was welcomed into the army. Um, obviously he wanted, his main wish was to go and invade Venezuela, uh, but he had to increase his reputation first. And when he got to Cartagena, he wrote what is now known as the Cartagena Manifesto, which was a bit of a sort of report of the whole First Republic, what had, why it had gone wrong, what should have been done better, um, and his views on the future, uh, which is now studied, of course, with great interest by historians. Anyway, from Cartagena, uh, the problem was the royalists were off blocking the Magdalena River, which was the, the navigation of the, the artery, really, to Bogota, the capital. And um, Bolivar was posted to a little town on, on, the, on the banks of the Magdalena with 70 men and um, really probably told to stay there because all the other um, military commanders nearby were rather jealous of him and didn't know about these Venezuelans. Anyway, uh, Bolivar completely disobeyed orders and he conquered um, uh, uh, several, enough towns to free the whole Magdalena River uh, by January 1813. Um, which was, uh, uh, he was widely admired by the, um, by the uh, Colombians for that. Now Monteverde, meanwhile, back in Venezuela, um, intended to invade uh, Nueva Granada. Um, so Bolivar was sent to Cucuta, which is on the border between today's Venezuela and um, it's actually just in, in Colombia. Um, and he became a very effective guerrilla fighter. He moved faster than his enemy expected. He was continually underestimated and he effectively fought Monteverdi off. Um, and Granada, Nueva Granada declared its independence. So, so all was good at that stage, um, but um, Bolivar um, hadn't um, done, he, his Venezuela was still in the hands of the royalists. So um, despite opposition, he marched for Venezuela with 500 men. 
he was welcomed in Merida and the mountains and uh, several other towns um, and, and battles continued. Um, uh, and it was quite a, a, quite a dirty war as well. Um, now, totally against orders, um, Bolivar continued the whole way towards Caracas. And he defeated Monteverde's 5,000 troops in just 10 days. And that campaign, campaign is known, or what was known um, in his lifetime, as the Admiral Campaign. Um, there was a, a battle at Valencia, and then they entered Caracas. And he was welcomed, he said, like Caesar, uh, um, with um, girls wearing white and flowers and all the rest of it. And he met his first mistress of significance, Josefina, in, um, in Caracas. Um, and he said, uh, he gave a rousing speech when he got there. Um, compatriots, he said, I haven't come to oppress you with my uh, arms. Um, I've come to bring you um, the, the power of laws. And I have come to, um, uh, with the, the idea to conserve our sacred rights. So a visionary and idealist even then. Um, sadly, it didn't last long. Uh, 1500 Spaniards had been left in Caracas and Monteverde was still in the fort at uh, Puerto Cabello and was resupplied by 1200 troops. So a dirty war began. Uh, Spanish were shot uh, when perhaps they shouldn't have been prisoners. Um, and the so-called legions of hell came out of the plains. Now, um, I, I, poor Miguel Mesa, the chap on the horse bottom left, um, is a descendant of the legions of hell, but I would never <laughs> put him in that category. These were ex-criminals um, mainly, <clears throat> uh, sorry, no, the legions of hell weren't ex-criminals, but, but Jose Tomas Boves, who led them, was an ex-criminal, originally a sailor from Spain, um, who had got together this band of um, uh, Gianeros, as they're called, uh, horsemen from the plains of Venezuela. So they, they rode bareback and barefooted. Um, they uh, had lances, uh, muskets of the day were quite slow to load. So if you were a lancer and could gallop, uh, you were at a pretty good advantage. Uh, and soon this guy, uh, Bovis, had a force of 7,000. And as I said before, those of mixed race tended to support the Spanish. So he came in on the side of the Spanish with Monteverdi and um, uh, it became a, a brutal civil war, really. Um, and in the end, um, um, Bolivar had to flee, the Republicans had to flee and, um, and uh, for, from Caracas to Barcelona, uh, 200 miles away. Um, they lost a battle at Aragua. Um, Bovis um, uh, entered Caracas, and that was the end of the Second Republic. Uh, Bovis did, in fact, um, pursue uh, the Republicans to, to, to the east, towards uh, Barcelona and Cumaná, and was killed in a skirmish. So that was the end of him. But at the end of the Second Republic, Margarita Island was the only Republican outpost remaining. Um, so um, Bolivar uh, uh, had, to, had to leave the country again. He went back to Cartagena, where he was warmly welcomed, uh, respected. Um, and he spent some time there. He helped free Bogota from the Royalists um, who'd, who'd, who'd crept in. Um, and um, while he was doing this, Spain uh, finally began to wake up and dispatched a fleet of 60 ships um, to Venezuela under Pablo Morillo uh, in the picture down the right, who was a, um, an experienced general. And his mission was to reconquer Venezuela, then Nueva Granada, then Quito, and then um, um, Argentina. At that stage, Peru was still, was the only colony still loyal to Spain. Uh, Maria arrived in um, Cartagena. Um, um, Bolivar had left for Jamaica at this point. Uh, he 
Cartagena has an incredibly strong fort, any of you have been there, uh, and he uh, besieged it for 180 days and uh, most of the residents of Cartagena died. And at that stage, Spain seemed back in control. Oliva was in the Caribbean and um, he was corresponding with the US, with Britain, with any potential allies he could think of uh, being very diplomatic. And his best known publication from that time is called The Letter from Jamaica, which he sent to a US senator um, to try and uh, persuade um, him to, to provide support to the independence movement. Uh, he sailed to, but he was very short of money. He had, he had no, no weapons. He sailed to Haiti, um, where the then president and some local Caribbean businessmen um, did support him financially and with, um, with what he needed in terms of boats and, and, and weapons uh, because um, they wanted to open up trade. And one of the conditions of General Petion from Haiti was that Bolivar could only go back to Venezuela if he agreed to abolish slavery. Now that was that was fine with Bolivar because that was generally his his um, view as well. But throughout his life, it is probably one of the reasons why he didn't get more support uh, from the U.S., uh, who of course at that time was very dependent on on slavery. Um, anyway, in 1816. Uh, Morillo introduced more brutal laws, tried to subdue Venezuela, but he struggled to keep uh, control of both Venezuela and Nueva Granada. Um, so Bolivar took advantage and he sailed from Haiti with his supplies and he landed on Margarita Island. And I think the other thing that he'd learned at this point was he, it was really difficult to take Caracas in the mountains. Um, whereas if you were in the south of, of Venezuela and Colombia, it's this uh, area of, of flat plains, which most of the year was quite transitable, either by river or horseback. And so he made his base at Angostura, which is the point uh, today of, the, uh, of a bridge, uh, the narrowest point on the Orinoco. Today it's called Ciudad Bolívar. Um, anyway, that was his base. He decided that Janos was key because of mobility. And he also, at that point, had managed to persuade these vicious lancers to come to his cause. Um, they were led now by a chap called Jose Antonio Pais, who you can see in both of the bottom pictures, and eventually became um, uh, president of Venezuela many years later. Um, uh, Pais was a typical, um, um, outlaw type plainsman. Um, he was born in, in, in Venezuela, he was a cattle trailer, um, and he was known as the Lion of Apure. Apure is the biggest uh, state of southern Venezuela. Um, and uh, he defeated Morillo's um, forces in an epic battle on the Llanos uh, by a clever strategy. They would, they would gallop away as if they were retreating. All the dust would, would build up around the horses. And then in the dust and confusion, they'd do an absolutely rapid uh, 180 degree turn and charge the Spanish head on. And, um, and they, they managed to use that tactic several times during the campaigns. Um, so there were a few setbacks uh, during this period. Uh, also at this time uh, in the south of the continent, San Martin, was invading Chile, but that's a side note in another story. In 1818, uh, Pais actually met Bolivar. Um, the other really significant thing that happened then was the Peninsula War had just finished. And so there were a lot of out of work soldiers um, in, in Britain. And Bolivar's recruitment drive in London, his, his contacts through Grafton Street, um, they were mercenaries, employed them as mercenaries, and in the end, um, 5,000 troops came from Britain and Ireland, um, who were absolutely vital uh, to, to the outcome of the, um, of, of, of the campaign. Bolivar was also a great publicist. He, he founded one of the early newspapers called El Correo del Orinoco, 
um, because he knew you had to get the word out there and you had to get your PR machine in place. He inaugurated a Congress in Angostura in 1819 um, and gave another rousing speech, uh, espousing education for all, civil liberty. Uh, he wanted a powerful president elected for life. He wanted a hereditary Senate. He got that idea from, from our House of Lords. Um, and he, but he was worried about uh, racial mixtures. He thought that was going to be a, a flame for potential conflict. And he finished his rousing speech by resigning as president. But the next day, by popular acclaim, he was re-elected. And that was another pattern to his life. Um, anyway, he, he returned to uh, West, to, the, to Apuri, to the, to the plains up against Colombia, nearest to Colombia, and um, was starting to make some progress in, in his battle against Morillo, but it was difficult because of the, uh, as I said earlier, Caracas was a really difficult target. So Bolivar came up with the crazy idea of um, uh, um, going on a diversionary trip. Um, in today's Colombia, uh, um, the royalists again had, had, had taken back Bogota. And Bolivar said, well, you know, let's just cross the Andes and let's go and beat them. And no one thought it could be done. But um, he had heard Murillo say, the interior of the continent is at the mercy of whoever rules in Bogota. And I suspect Bolivar's vision was already bigger than just Venezuela. Um, so he persuaded his, his generals that they should, with some difficulty, that they should do this. It was just the end of the dry season. The rains were coming and they set off. And uh, the first two weeks would have been in wading through conditions like this. Um, um, with plenty of piranhas to nibble their feet, no doubt, as you can see in the bottom picture. Uh, that's a typical shot of the Venezuelan and actually Colombian um, plains. Um, they got to, the, they, you then reach the Andes. Um, they had to cross a pass 14,000 feet. Um, it must have been cold. It was, it was then there little winter they have there. It was miserable. A lot of people died, um, but he managed it a bit like um, Hannibal. Uh, and of course, the other side, um, the Spanish weren't expecting him at all. So this is a little shot for the botanists. This is a rather unusual plant called Nespolicia, which, which only lives here above 10,000 feet. It has a, a velvet on its leaves uh, to um, protect them from, from the cold, other things. Um, uh, anyway, he, um, he arrived in uh, the, the, what is now um, close to Bogota at a place called Boyacá and uh, took battle to the Spanish, uh, who, as I say, weren't expecting him. And uh, there was a, this was the ultimate battle for independence of today's Colombia. Boyacá, 1,600 prisoners taken, a total success. And, um, and this is Bolívar's quote, a weak man requires a long fight in order to win, a strong one delivers a single blow and an empire vanishes. He was always someone for the grand word. And uh, he established a basic government, uh, appropriated a few mines, uh, which uh, apparently had been Humboldt's uh, suggestion, um, that they should be exploited more because he needed to finance his campaign and left a chap called Santander in charge of, of Bogota and Bolivar headed back east with his grey horse Palomo and a printing press which he always took with him on campaign. Now um, there was a sort of slight stalemate here uh, neither side had uh, enough soldiers really to do to have a decisive battle. So uh, his his warlords, for want of a better word, was, were kept falling out whenever he wasn't there. Um, but he returned to Angostura and he called for the creation of a country called Gran Colombia, and that I think is the first time when this Gran Colombia 
um, is mentioned. So that's Venezuela, Colombia, uh, um, and he didn't tell Ecuador, but today is Ecuador as well. Um, Morillo was still in Caracas. Um, he just asked Spain for 20,000 troops, but there'd been a strike in, in, in Cadiz in Spain, and uh, Ferdinand had uh, changed the laws and, and Spanish soldiers were no longer allowed to take plunder. So uh, another reason why those 20,000 troops never arrived. Anyway, so they were both in the stalemate and Bolivar actually met Morillo and in a little mountain town in the Andes uh, called Santa Ana and they agreed a ceasefire. Morillo then returned to Spain uh, and he left a rather uh, less competent general in charge called La Torre. So that all worked in Bolivar's favor in the end. Bear in mind this war had been going on for 10 years at this stage. Um, now, um, the ceasefire ended when there was a little uprising in, in Maracaibo, ended in, in 1821. And so this was an excuse to get going again. And Bolivar planned a final battle um, the uh, Royalist troops were based at Carabobo, um, just outside, uh, just west of Caracas. And um, so he split their armies by a feint for Caracas by one of his generals. And then he gathered from various sides of the country, masterly campaign, and um, there was an epic battle at um, Carabobo, which uh, between 5,000 royalists and six and a half thousand patriots on the 24th of June and the day was saved by uh, for the uh, for Bolivar's side by again by Paez's horsemen and by the British Legion who in a particularly dark spell of the battle had to form their classic squares and today if you go anywhere in Venezuela and mention the British Legion um, people will recognize that they're still very respected even now. Anyway, the result of that was independence of Venezuela. Bolivar was an, uh, elected president of Gran Colombia uh, and he returned to Cucuta to take office. Um, but he decided uh, he never wanted to be a governor. Uh, he, was, he considered himself a military man. Uh, I am a son of war, a man whom combat has raised to government. A man like me is a dangerous citizen for a popular government, a threat to national sovereignty. So he was always very clear about that. Um, and uh, incidentally, at the same time, uh, San Martin was accepting uh, Peru's surrender that same month. Uh, he'd come up from Chile. So um, uh, with O'Higgins and Cochrane, but again, that's another story. So um, the next stage was uh, Quito, hadn't been uh, liberated at this stage. Um, but uh, this, this young man, Antonio José Sucre, who was 12 years younger than Bolívar, one of his most successful generals, uh, Bolívar considered him a son, uh, very much admired him, thought he was a bright, uh, bright young thing. Um, he was sent to Guayaquil on the Pacific coast of, of today's Ecuador, which had declared independence but needed protecting. Bolivar marched from, from the north uh, towards Quito, um, lost many men, there were uh, uh, strong rather outholds uh, out there. Um, Bolivar fought a battle at a place called Bombona, and, but uh, all six of his officers were were killed and he left in a stretcher due to a fever um, but the royalists hadn't won either and and uh, had been distracted enough so Sucre could come around the corner uh, and Sucre won the epic battle of Pichincha uh, which is a volcano that overlooks Quito and that left-hand photograph is taken from Pichincha and at that stage Gran Colombia was then complete because Panama had sort of liberate, liberated itself and, um, and said, can we join too? Um, so there were great celebrations uh, uh, in Quito, um, where celebrations like that still happen today. Uh, th this was the stage at which um, Bolivar met uh, Manuela Sainz. Manuela, his most famous mistress, 
who was with him, in fact, for the rest of his life. He was a very, very feisty, cigar-smoking um, Ecuadorian um, girl, um, probably as much of a soldier as he was. Um, now, Saint Martin uh, uh, was struggling at this time to, main control, uh, to maintain control of Peru. Um, he, his vision was different from Bolivar's. His vision was of a monarchy uh, uh, system, which Bolivar absolutely didn't want. Um, so Saint Martin needed help, and he, he was nervous of Bolivar, but he thought, well, I better meet him. So he came to Guayaquil, and the two men met for the only time in their lives. They had three private conversations, and we don't really know uh, what was said, um, apart from the fact that San Martin was asking for help, um, and um, Bolivar himself wouldn't go to Peru because of local unrest in Guayaquil, and San Martin left. Uh, it sounds like they were very different characters. Bolivar was a great dancer, uh, loved nothing more than the party. San Martin, as I think that photograph prob uh, painting probably indicates, was a more serious soul and a professional soldier who'd done all his soldiering in, in, in Spain. Anyway, San Martin left, uh, left Peru in fact, and returned to Mendoza, where he was from, uh, and spent the last years of his life in London and Europe. As I say, that's a different story. Meanwhile, uh, Bolivar was tasked really with the, with the job of, of keeping uh, Peru independent. So he sent Sucre to Lima with his arm and, army and he followed it a few days later. Um, but the Peruvians were tricky. Duplicity was everywhere. Um, and Boliv Bolivar was, this is the, the central square in Lima, which probably hasn't changed very much since that time. Um, duplicity was everywhere. L Bolivar got very ill at this stage on the coast, probably with early uh, 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 tuberculosis. Um, and, uh, but despite that, he, he managed to plan a campaign. Uh, and he advanced south uh, with 9,000 men through the Andes. Again, another Andean crossing, just south of the Cordillera Blanca, which is a beautiful mountain range on the Pacific coast of Peru. Um, and up onto the highlands uh, near a rich um, silver mine. Sucre had been ahead of him and prepared the route. Uh, Bolivar won uh, the first battle at Junin uh, decisively. Um, and um, and uh, then the rainy season, season came and Bolivar returned to Lima, but the, the country hadn't been liberated and it was left to Sucre um, to, uh, who's only 29 still at this stage, uh, to fight the, the royalists at Ayacucho, which is uh, considered to be the battle for final independence of Peru in December 1824, and he won that one. And Britain and the US uh, recognized Colombia, and they called Bolivar at this stage the George Washington of South America. And with that battle in Peru, uh, because as I said earlier, Upper Peru, uh, today's Bolivia, was all part, um, the Spanish, uh, Spain had lost all of her colonies in South America. Now, uh, just a little side note on, on Bolivia, uh, which um, was initially called Bolivar, uh, but very shortly uh, the name was changed to Bolivia. It was uh, destined to be part of, of uh, intended to be part of, of Gran Colombia. That's Manuela, by the way, on the left. Um, but for various reasons, Bolivar decided to make it a separate country. Um, it was very wealthy, the famous silver mine at Potosí. So the local aristocrats didn't want to be part of some other nation. It was also being pulled in the direction of Argentina and pulled in the direction of Peru. So Bolivar's eventual uh, solution to that was to make it its own country, uh, which it remains. Um, anyway, he went on a bit of a tour. He left Manuela behind um, and uh, he went to Arequipa where he put his old mate Rodriguez in to, uh, to, to start a school. 
um, Rodriguez just caused trouble, I think. Uh, he had a triumphant entrance into Cusco, where he was given a crown and a horse and built an aqueduct. Um, he gave all these things away, not the aqueduct, but he gave everything he was given away. Um, and he was reunited, he went to La Paz, uh, and that I think is about as far south as he got, uh, personally, and was reunited with Sucre at Lake Titicaca. So Bolivar's next uh, 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 job really was more political. He wrote a constitution, uh, the, the Bolivian constitution. Um, it was full of equality, social justice, uh, and as I said earlier, he did believe in a benevolent president for life. He didn't think any of the countries of Latin America were ready, for example, for democracy. But he was a lone voice. When he was there, his energy uh, was enough to maintain um, things. But as soon as he left, uh, I think no one else's energy was of his level and things tended to fizzle out. So 1825 was a year of squabbles. And uh, Bolivar said that Spain with its colonies had never encouraged cooperation between colonies. And so they hadn't been used to cooperation. So trying to enforce this, this cooperation was a problem. Although at this time, Argentina did, did contact Bolivar and say, can you please come and liberate Uruguay for us? Uh, and he was tempted, but I think he saw it wouldn't be possible and he, he turned them down. He tried to organize a, a Congress of Latin American states in Panama in 1826, but that was a bit of a flop too. So the next few years was frustrating for, for him. Uh, I've said monarchy and muddles. Um, he left Peru, never returned there. Manuela followed, uh, not entirely intentionally because she, she'd been arrested um, and was sent to Guayaquil with some prisoners. Um, um, and Bolivar quickly fell out of favor in Peru. He went to Bogota, uh, where Santander was sowing discontent and rumors against him. Everyone was squabbling about constitutions. Uh, he got a rather subdued welcome that time. He continued overland to Venezuela and met Pais in Valencia because Pais had been spreading rumors about Bolivar wanting to be king, which couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, but they made up for them. In, um, and in 1827, he entered Caracas with more arches and flowers and girls dressed up in, in white and music. Um, but Caracas was financially bust, um, uh, having spent entirely a $30 million loan that Britain had, had, had lent it, um, mainly on, on the wars. Of course, sadly, uh, it now seems to have come full circle. Um, and meanwhile, in Lima, Santander, who'd sent some troops there, they rebelled uh, uh, and they, they tried to install a Peruvian general in, in, in Guayaquil. Um, so Bolivar, again, had to gather his army um, and march to Bogota um, uh, and to sort things out. Um, he, um, his detractors, when he got back to Bogota, did, did flee in panic. Um, and, and he asked for and, and was granted absolute power uh, and was finally uh, reunited with, with, with Manuela. But the journey had taken its toll and he felt uh, for the first time like an old man and he took refuge outside Bogota um, and, um, and, uh, and, and more squabbling was going on, constitutional businesses, people were trying to take his power away, even though ultimately it failed. The people, the people loved him, um, but he squabbled with, the, with, with everyone else, it seems to me. Uh, he kept himself busy. He, he ordered a survey of a canal in Panama, which of course was built in the end. Maybe that was another of Humboldt's suggestions. Um, and quite significantly in 1828, um, there was an assass assassination plot against him. Um, he had to leap out of his bedroom window, uh, even though he had a fever uh, and uh, the middle of the night and, um, and uh, Manuela lent him her shoes or something. And anyway, she was referred to by him thereafter as the Libertadora, the Libertador. Um, uh, the perpetrators were caught, uh, many were executed, even though Bolivar didn't want that. And Santander, who was found to be one of the ringleaders, 
was banished. But the whole thing affected him deeply, that people had wanted to assassinate him. Um, Sucre was appointed to run a uh, ruler of southern Colombia and then sent to fight the Peruvians uh, who were trying to invade, despite the fact that Bolivar had liberated them and, and Sucre, of course. Um, so Bolivar went back to Guayaquil, became very ill. Um, he left his former aide, uh, Daniel O'Leary, uh, who's a fascinating character and I'd like to learn more about him. He um, was born in Ireland, but he wrote a 23 volume uh, biography of, of Bolivar and managed to keep all Bolivar's letters against all of us, uh, which uh, is the reason we know so much about him. Uh, left Daniel O'Leary in charge of Bogota, uh, but Bolivar was running out of energy, I think, at this stage, and, and he just wanted to, to, to quieten down, uh, but wasn't allowed to do so. And in 1829, Pyles announced that Venezuela would separate from Gran Colombia. And then I think Bolivar finally saw that he couldn't hold the, the, the Gran Colombia countries together. And so he announced the three separate states of Venezuela, Ecuador, and Colombia, which is, which is what we have now. Um, and in 1830, Bolivar stood down finally as president. Sucre read out his final address where he admitted the great cost of independence and um, tried to defend his reputation. Uh, ill, he tried to convalesce outside Bogota. He had no money because he'd given it all away. He, so, he hoped that Sucre would succeed him, but that didn't happen. He was barred by the other um, other petty sort of generals, um, and um, Bolivar left. And he, his intention was to go and retire somewhere in Europe. So he went 600 miles down the Magdalena River to Cartagena, um, waiting for a boat, which didn't come. Um, so while he was in Cartagena, Sucre, his protege and really the person he considered his son was, was assassinated, picture top right, while returning to his family in Quito. Um, Bolivar was deeply affected by that and it sent him into a decline. Um, Manuela was still in, in Bogota. She tried to stir up as much trouble as she could, uh, but in the end, she too was forced to flee and, and followed Bolivar down the Magdalena. He then moved to uh, Barranquilla, which is just, just east along the coast from Cartagena, because it, it should have been a bit cooler. He was feeling a bit hot, but there it was too cold. So finally, he was offered a place to rest, and um, uh, he was quite ill by this stage, probably with tuberculosis, uh, in Santa Marta, which is a lovely colonial city uh, on the coast just where the Andean mountains come down into the Pacific. Um, there you can see a, a picture of today's army in on the square in Santa Marta, which I think, Jill, if you're watching, you took that picture. Um, and he was offered refuge at a hacienda called San Pedro Alejandrino, just outside Santa Marta. And um, while he was there, he, um, a local doctor cared for him. Um, he called for Manuela and he was persuaded to write his will. And his uh, final words start as, the, as you see on the slide. Colombians, you have witnessed my efforts to launch liberty where tyranny once reigned. If my death can heal and fortify the union, I go to my death in peace. Um, which is what he did. And sadly, um, Manuela didn't arrive in time. And no. there is his, his um, the Santa Marta mausoleum and the bed in which he died, draped with the, with the flag. Anyway, so, so that was the life of Bolivar. And just a few words on what happened afterwards. Um, he was... He was buried in Santa Marta 
but that wasn't going to satisfy all the people who were so clamoring for, for the spirit of Bolivar, if you like. And in the end, his body, but not his heart, uh, was taken to Caracas by, by Pais. And that's the picture you can see bottom right, the, the procession, um, uh, 12 years later. And so I guess the Bolivar myth began. Um, in 1870, uh, his body was again transferred from the cathedral to the newly been, built um, Pantheon uh, by the then dictator of Venezuela. And even more weirdly, uh, 10 years ago, uh, one Hugo Chavez uh, uh, exhumed his body and carted him around Caracas a bit to bolster his own image. So it, um, I think in a way the most calming statue is the, is the lovely one there at the top right in, in Santa Marta. He was a visionary, he was idealistic, he was obviously charismatic um, and full of energy. Two countries um, uh, ended up named after him, two currencies, most of the main squares of uh, all, I think all of the central squares of, in Venezuela are called the Plaza Bolivar. Um, but his legacy is, is, is mixed and he, is, he has been hijacked by many as well. Um, I'm gonna finish just with two quotations um, which perhaps sum up his frustration with the whole independence um, process. In one speech, he said, fellow citizens, I blush to say this, independence is the only benefit we have acquired to the detriment of all the rest. And then perhaps one of his better, best known uh, quotations, when he said, all who served the revolution have plowed the sea, which I think is beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, I, I can't leave you without telling you that <laughs> you know where our brochure is when you want to go to Colombia or Ecuador, sadly not Venezuela probably. Um, and I'm also going to just uh, share with you uh, uh, a little reading list. Um, the uh, scholarly uh, uh, approach uh, to Simon Bolivar if you want to go into the whole thing in far more detail than we've had time for today, is John Lynch's book, A Life, absolutely wonderful. Um, and of course, uh, Garcia Marquez's novel, uh, The General in, in His Labyrinth, is a story of the last month or so of Bolivar's life uh, in, in a sort of fiction. Um, but the book for me that made it um, come alive was this one by Marie Arana, um, Bolivar, which is, um, was published in 2014. Here we are, beautifully written. I think you can tell she writes novels as well. So I, if I was to recommend one book, I think that would be it. Um, and um, that little photograph bottom left is, a, is an enigmatic, he was called a liberator, that's Don Pedro I of Brazil, but that again is a completely different story. So thank you all very much. I'm going to now stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, for hanging around. <laughs>